Hi, well, welcome to the third Facebook Live today. I am really happy to have my partner in crime, my husband, uh, Arthur Pansioli, who's an emergency medicine physician with me. He's going to take questions at the end, too. Um, but much like yesterday, I thought it would be helpful to kind of run through an update like I did. So we'll start with kind of global update, US update, uh, Ohio update, Cincinnati update, talk about testing, and then we'll get to a whole bunch of questions. And I have a whole bunch of questions that have come in over the last 24 hours and then some today. So um, again, everything changes day to day. We continue to have an increase in cases globally. So we're up over 230,000 cases. The best news I think today is that China has had the first day where they've had no new cases. So clearly we've kind of hit a peak there. And I think we can get a lot of information about what's gonna happen both in Italy and here in the US from what's really happened in China, although obviously there's some differences. The bad news is Italy is in terrible shape. Um, so Italy continues to have a really escalating rise in number of cases. Um, they are up over 41,000 cases. It's up another 7,000 cases from yesterday. And the worst thing to tell you is that now the deaths in Italy exceed the deaths in China. So the deaths in Italy now are 3,400 up from 3,100 in China. And obviously the population of those countries are very, very different. And you have to believe that that's because China did a really good job in quarantining measures. Um, Italy is terribly struggling with taking care of their sick and really struggling to bury their dead. Um, and it's a bad situation. And again, it goes back to this is why it's so important we're doing what we're doing in the United States. So other good news. So progress really is being made quickly on a vaccine and there are estimates now that hopefully we will have something available in the next 12 months. Now there's lots of news buzz out there about treatment and President Trump in his briefing this morning mentioned drug development and specifically chloroquine, a drug called Plaquenil that I have many patients taking, um, appears to have some benefit for treating um, people who are infected with COVID. I will tell you the data that's published comes out of a French trial of 36 patients, incredibly small. It is not ready for prime time, and I have questions already today and people asking for Plaquenil prescriptions, and I'm going to kind of get into that. We are not ready for um, giving out Plaquenil and having patients mass stockpiling it yet. The data is just not there. Um, the other thing, there's been um, some discussion in the media today about blood type and whether or not certain blood types are associated with a better prognosis yeah, or a worse yeah. prognosis. So I just uh, want to make that very... And, um, it looks like, although again, these are small trials out of China, uh, that blood type A is associated with a worse infection and a more serious course and blood type O less severe. Although this was, again, looking at 2000 patients in one particular area of China. Um, the other thing that's really, you know, blood type A is the most common. So it's hard to know that we have enough data to really make that clear yet. Okay, switching to the US. So again, cases continue to rise and it's really a problem. We're up over 10,700 cases. That's another 3,500 cases in about the last 20 hours. Um, Ohio, we've now seen our first two cases in Hamilton County. Um, unfortunately, uh, Governor DeWine's press release started at 2.30, so it's not quite over. So we're doing this today kind of in the middle of um, his update, so I don't have any specific information from today from his recommendations. I can tell you that the big thing in the news right now is that the Ohio Department of Health is really talking again and again about um, the real shortage we have in testing capacity because of a shorting, shortage in materials, specifically the tubing to transport the viral um, testing to uh, even commercial labs. Um, and so there's a big push, which we'll talk about, and I know Dr. Pansioli will talk about a little bit to kind of increase capacity here in Cincinnati by um, some of the labs starting to develop their own uh, testing uh, medium and testing capability here. So in Hamilton County, as I said, we now have two confirmed cases. The good news is so far, no one has died in the state of Ohio, um, which is great. Now, in terms of testing sites, so this again is something that in every video I've done in the last several days, I keep talking about changes day to day to day to day. So last week um, for high risk patients, I was doing very select testing in my office. As I talked about, um, the hope was as we um, opened um, off-site testing facilities that the health systems were developing, that we would be able to consolidate all testing to these um, specific facilities. So the good news, as I talked about yesterday, was all of the health systems have gotten involved and have a 
um, protocol for screening patients off-site. All of the health systems have really done a great job of ramping up. What's become clear though, unfortunately, now in the last 24 hours, as we've all ramped up the testing facilities, and as I thought that the hope was going to be that we would be able to test more and more people, now the problem, as I mentioned already, is that we don't have enough testing capability. So the places, the facilities are actually open, but we can't process the number of tests. And this has really come back to now, and I'm gonna talk a lot about this, which is, we cannot be testing asymptomatic people. We cannot be testing the masses. We really, 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 and I'm imploring anyone that's listening to realize we can't be testing asymptomatic people. We shouldn't be testing asymptomatic people, even people that have mild infection. We don't need to be testing because I want you to think about it. Testing is not going to change how we're going to manage you. And really, at this time of crisis, we really have to make sure that we're testing very appropriate people. And I know Art's gonna talk about that a little um, bit as well. So before I let him talk, I'm gonna run through the questions that um, I have already gotten today. So we talked, I get questions about blood type. Um, and so I mentioned, you know, there's this little bit of data that if you're type A, you're at higher risk, you're type O, you're at lower risk. But again, type A is more common and I don't know that that's really been proven yet, but again, it's incidental um, anecdotal information. Um, I got a call from a patient today about raloxifene and COVID infection. Raloxifene is a medication that we use for treatment of osteoporosis. We also use it for risk reduction of breast cancer in patients at high risk. As far as I'm aware, there's no data about any concerns with continued raloxifene use. Um, so chloroquine, Plaquenil, we talked about for COVID. And again, I really want to encourage um, patients to be I'm mindful that, again, the study that was published was teeny tiny 30 patients. Um, again, it looks promising. There are lots of drugs in the pipeline. There's really rapid activity um, to develop this and get this out quickly. But again, I am not in a position, and I want to make sure you know I'm not in a position, and I'm not going to um, allow patients just to stockpile medications out of fear right now based on this little data. There's just absolutely no reason to do it at this point. And again, I promise you as soon as there is appropriate data um, and we can prescribe it for the right reason, that will become available, but it's not now. So I encourage you not to call me to ask um, for uh, prescriptions of Plaquenil. Um, Chloroquine, yeah. Um, so how can non-medical people help the medical professions from home? Um, I can tell you, and I'll let Art talk to this too, I mean, I think the biggest thing is appropriate utilization of healthcare services right now, right? So I can tell you that, um, you know, we all feel, all of us who are on the front lines feel really pressured. This is a really hard time right now. And, you know, we understand, we all feel anxiety. Um, there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of concern about the health system being overloaded and not having adequate capacity. And so as a patient, I just think you really have to be mindful. We certainly wanna take care of you when we're sick. We certainly wanna answer your questions, but, you know, inappropriate stuff or things that can be uh, postponed and delayed, um, I think now is the time to try to hold back and try to make really good decisions about when you're utilizing healthcare right now, particularly emergency room services. And I don't know if you want to say any more to that. Well, we can talk about it a lot. Um, the simple fact is, despite these small trials pointing to this medicine or that, there's no data whatsoever to support those things. This disease process, COVID-19, um, is not known to have any particular therapy above and beyond supportive care if you come to a medical center. It can give you oxygen if you're truly what we call hypoxic or low on oxygen. God forbid, if you're really super sick, we can intubate you and put you in an ICU. We can give you IV fluids, but short of that, there is nothing special that we're going to do. And quite frankly, if there's no specific therapy, unless you're really, really sick, what are you doing by coming to a healthcare facility other than exposing yourself to people who might have it or the healthcare workers and the people that are there if you have it? This really is a stay home disease process. And for anybody who isn't really, really sick, if you don't, if you're not sick enough, you need to be admitted to the hospital, don't come. And I know that's terrifying and hard. What we're trying to do in practice, you know, in our practice right now, is again, I had a conversation with a patient yesterday. Um, you know, low grade temperature, um, she's doing okay. She's 50 and healthy. Um, it's 
presumptive that she has COVID. Uh, she was traveling in Europe. It is presumptive that she has it. Um, there's no reason for her to get tested and there's no reason for her to come in to seek medical care. She's doing okay. Now with that said, right, everybody's terrified. You know, we want to check in with her every single day and make sure that she's improving as most people will. And clearly if there's any concern that she's hypoxic, worsening, getting more sick, that's when she needs to be admitted to the hospital. But again, we want to be your partner, primary care. You know, he's taking care of you when you need to be intubated and admitted. Um, but from my standpoint, I'm the person that I hope can be helpful to make some decision about when you need to access the emergency room and to help give you some support taking care of yourself at home. Okay, so should anyone who's flown in the last few days self-quarantine regardless of where they traveled from? So again, there is no immediate mandate and no clear guidance on this. I can tell you this just goes back to the whole discussion that we've had a million times about social distancing. Airplanes are closed environments. One sick person or one infected person, even if they're not having symptoms, but they're shedding virus on an airplane, can infect multiple people. It's a closed space. Um, and so again, I think people who travel on airplanes and come home should be presumed likely or possibly to be infected and they should self-quarantine to the best of their ability. Now, there's no specific guidance saying that they shouldn't go to work and I don't know exactly you know, what to do about that. I don't know if you have any other specific comments, but it's, yeah, again, at the, at the first sign of illness, you should stay home, but. Um, well, and, and because you can shed virus for days, up to probably five days before you feel ill um, and you can become symptomatic anywhere between day two and day 14 from exposure, um, you really can't know. And the truth is, we, is who to self-quarantine? Everybody that can be home right now should be home. I mean, there are some of us who have to go to work. They probably want physicians like emergency physicians and stuff in the hospital. We gotta go. But there aren't a lot of jobs that can't be done remotely and there are many that don't need to be done. These are life threatening decisions we are all making. You know, if we infect a, a friend and that friend has an 85 year old amazing grandmother, we may have killed her. And that's unfortunate. We don't want to do that. This is a sharing country. Let's not share this. If I have a relative flying home from Mexico today, should I keep my kids away from her for some time? I think that's exactly the same as the conversation from um, you know, coming anywhere in the United States, uh, clearly the recommendation still is from high risk countries in Europe where it's so prevalent right now, it's really self quarantining for 14 days. Um, and again, from Mexico, there have been cases in Mexico again, but I would take it uh, as the US and really do the best you can to self quarantine. And if I had young kids or children at all, I would try to keep um, my kids away from that person for up to 14 days. Uh, do I think schools will close for the rest of the year? I honestly do. Uh, many schools in Ohio have already made that decision, many of the private schools. Um, I do think that that is likely to be the case. Um, as much as you know, I wish uh, with all my heart that this was going to be done and we were going to be back to normal in four weeks by the end of April, I unfortunately don't really think that that's the case. And I think, again, that's one of the biggest things that I think I, I face personally, and I predict many of you do too, is um, kind of the unknown of not knowing how long this is gonna be and really trying to set expectations of patients and my staff in the office and my children um, about what's coming. And none of us really know, but I do think it's gonna be longer than we all wish. I agree. I think the data and just the pattern of spread coming out of our uh, predecessor countries, uh, China and Italy in particular, we're looking at months. Unfortunately, exactly. um, are we taking new patients? Well, so this has been a really um, interesting question in the last couple of days. We've gotten a lot of calls about taking new patients. Um, if you've been, if you're a patient in the practice, you've been following any of my other videos. What we've really done in the practice now, at least for the next two weeks, I'm kind of working in two week increments now is one of the providers is going to be in the office every day um, doing uh, urgent visits only, and we're only going to have one patient in the office at a time, right? So we don't want any patient to patient contact, and we're really doing everything we can to 
Um, again, it's not perfect, but keep things as sterile and clean and patients and staff protected. So we probably are limited really to 12 patients a day, which is really not very many in the office. So we're doing the rest of non-urgent visits. The other providers were working from home, uh, really doing telehealth visits, returning phone calls, doing um, you know uh, uh, messages through my chart. Um, for our established patients. Now, when it comes to new patients, what we've really decided to do is, again, in times of crisis, we're trying to um, adapt. And so we've modified what we're doing with our direct primary care um, kind of um, practice and how we're doing it. So we don't wanna be a one and done urgent care visit kind of thing for you. We don't think that's the best medical care. So we don't really want to do one-off consults and answer questions. We'd really like you if you're interested and think you need help to become a patient in the practice, but we want to make that uh, more doable. So we've changed it for our DPC that you would just have to sign up to be a DPC patient for three months only. Um, what that would allow us to do is schedule a one hour telehealth comp, uh, appointment with you first. So we could do a comprehensive intake, really establish a good chart on you and really feel like we had enough information to provide assistance and then be able to provide care for you longitudinally, which is the way that we really like to do it and feel that we can provide the best patient care. Um, so again, if um, you have an urgent need and you're interested in being a direct primary care patient, please call us because what we've decided is we are going to make arrangements to do that via telehealth right now. And then once this is all over, we'll obviously see you in the office. We don't do continuity, continuity of care in my shop. Okay. So let's <clears throat> see ones from just now. Should we have people at our house, at our house cleaning company or family or friends? You want to give your opinion? Yeah, I would say no one if you can. There, there's there's almost no reason right now to, to be in contact with others. Um, let, let the house get a little dusty, you know. Phone your friends, Skype them or do any of those things. And if you're 13 and actually know how to do that, you, could, you can do that. Um, no. P.S. My husband's a really good housekeeper, and I'm really making him be the housekeeper. He's a good cook, too. But. Volunteering. <laughs> um, my question, is there... Uh, is there has been regarding self swabbing? Would this not be a problem due to the fact that the swab has to be placed deep in the nose or throat? Would this not provide false negatives by poor testing procedures? Well, so that's interesting. So first of all, I don't know if you've ever had a real nasal swab, but they're really uncomfortable and that would be a very hard thing to do yourself. Um, and even a oral swab, you really have to make yourself gag to do this right. You really have to get a lot of secretions. It's uncomfortable. Um, the bigger issue in my standpoint, right, is that it's actually a great idea if we had endless testing swabs and containers and we could do that. That might be an option we could teach people maybe. But the problem is right now we are so limited by testing capabilities. Again, not by locations because the health systems have done a great job putting up these tents and making these centers. Now it's really all about capacity with swabs. And so again, we don't have the capacity to be testing anyone either at the testing facilities or with home swabs. Um, if someone contracts COVID-19 and they recover from it, can they contract it again or will they be immune going forward? You wanna take it? Uh, the answer is we hope so. Um, we can't be sure. Um, like all things, the COVID viruses, the cold viruses, we know they mutate. And that's why you can get a cold in, in subsequent years. Um, we hope that this will confer some sort of immunity. Um, we have reason to think so, but we don't have the science yet. And what I think we probably hope is coming is blood serology testing. So we can detect whether or not someone has had prior infection and has antibodies so we can get a sense of immunity. And I'm sure that with the masses of people that now we're going to have data on people that have been infected, we will learn this. But um, right now we certainly don't have serology testing um, either and we don't really know that. Yeah, the fact that so many people are going to have very uh, minimal symptomatology is very reason uh, to think that there are gonna be a lot of us who are gonna be relatively immune to this for a, a period of time um, and we hope that's the case because that's that's eventually what shuts this thing down. So another question about the top of the curb uh, will be in mid-May. So does that mean we need to continue social distancing and staying home until then? 
You want the bad news? Just say yes. Yes. And you know, it's a really long time. Um, and you know, I am right there with you. This is, um, this is very hard. Um, I got on a group chat last night with a bunch of my women's health colleagues across the country, um, California at the Mayo and Florida in New York and Cleveland. Um, and the situation is tough for all of us. And I can tell you both as physicians, but just as humans, like the rest of you with families and, you know, uh, my one girlfriend is, you know, freaked out about where she's going to get her hair dyed. Um, it's, you know, this is a long haul, so this is not just a couple weeks thing. And uh, I think it's, I think it's long. I, I think it's, I think it's May. I think we're going to get all really missing every our friends and that contact. As a nurse, is there anything additional that we can do to protect ourselves from kids who might have it? Uh, what are you doing with your nurses? Oh, so the, the simple fact is, again, families should be should be essentially self-isolating. People in healthcare need to be very cognizant of what their family is doing, both because the healthcare worker doesn't want to get it from a family member who's been traipsing around and doing uh, social events with others. Um, and as healthcare workers, we do have fear that we'll take it home to our families. And if we do, again, we need to keep them in the house. We need to keep ourselves isolated from them as much as possible. It does place them at risk. We know that. I've had these discussions with my children who are home from high school and college, respectively. Um, but again, it's all about separating ourselves. And if a family gets it, keep it in that family cluster. That the nurse who has children, um, if the nurse becomes symptomatic, that nurse needs to stay home, keep the kids at home, uh, stay apart from as much as you can, but certainly don't let it get outside of that household. Are there any over-the-counter supplements that are beneficial to take uh, to help boost our immune system? So if you've been a patient in my practice, you probably know I'm not a huge supplement pusher at all. And the reason is the data is just not clear. Now there's um, a lot of um, you know integrative medicine practitioners and a lot of people much more knowledgeable in this community and nationally about specific supplements. And I know there's a lot of kind of discussion out there. It's not really my area of expertise, so I don't want to say yay or nay too much. What I would say, again, if you've been a patient in my practice and you know me very well, um, the deal is this, I'm all about healthy lifestyle. And what does that mean? It's not drinking too much alcohol. It's really eating well still during this time. It's really getting enough sleep. It's really um, continuing to exercise. Um, and again, as much as I say that, and as I've said to many of you in the practice before, don't do what I do, do what I say, because I can tell you I have had a very hard time already in the last week keeping to my exercise routine now that my gym is closed um, and sleep is disrupted and like, you know, nothing's perfect. And I've had more wine than I usually have this week because um, this has been stressful, frankly. Um, but again, um, I'm all about nutrition and exercise and sleep and diet. Um, so when you can, I'm sure, get information from uh, others who are more expert in integrative medicine about supplements that they think can be helpful, but I don't have that data. Any idea why the case numbers are not decreasing in Italy after 11 days of strict quarantine? Is there data supporting airborne transmission? So there isn't data to support airborne transmission other than um, in certain uh, situations, which we face in the emergency department all the time. Um, if we have to intubate a patient, if we have to give aerosolized medications, incidentally, interesting, doing the testing itself, if done right, and if that swab is truly placed all the way through the nose to the back of the throat till it hits the back, and then you swirl it for 10 to 15 seconds, unpleasant. Uh, you are going to cough, sneeze, gag, whatever. That is going to aerosolize particles, um, but that's a very brief thing. So those aerosolizations do create smaller, more airborne particles for which we wear the more aggressive uh, personal protective gear. But there isn't uh, data to support that this would in any way be aerosolized, um, like the measles vac uh, virus or, or tuberculosis or something like that. Fortunately, um, part of the reason for the numbers to still being continued is, you know, you can, if you're uh, exposed today, it can be two weeks before you develop symptomatology during which time you may have infected others. So the quarantine is going to take significant time to, to catch up. It's behind the curve right now. And again, I think that's the, the key thing is viral shedding prior to symptoms. But the other thing is that <clears throat> what we're, we, we are trying to do and what actually I support Governor DeWine doing in 
our state so much is being very strict now with the quarantine to the best of our ability, because if you look at the timing, Italy waited too long. If you think about it, they tried to close the northern border, the, you know, Milan and kind of the north part, thinking that that was going to be adequate to quarantine, and they completely missed the boat. So they waited many too many days before really shutting everything down. And that's what the messaging is here. I mean, I think, you know, it's hard for our children that are home. It's hard for anybody to think, you know, gosh, well, you know, I know you talk about that there's 10,000 cases, but we're in a country of 350 million. Like, what are we so worried about 10,000 cases? It's because the growth of that is exponential. And because again of this, when you do the math as a physician, as we're sitting here, right, we know that with exponential growth, we will be like Italy. We will overwhelm our healthcare system. We will not have the capacity. We have got to flatten the curve. We absolutely have to do it earlier than Italy because Italy's situation is grim. And um, I don't know exactly how far out they still think the peak is, but I don't think they've hit the top yet at all. And the crisis is bad there. So I think everybody's hoping um, that we've adopted our quarantine procedures early enough that we are going to to really make a bigger impact than Italy was able to make. But personally, if you've seen any of my stuff on social media, I'm distressed by the fact that, uh, you know, the beaches in Florida are still full and that people are really not paying attention to the social quarantining. Again, I, I'm really sad I'm not in Florida on spring break, but as my husband is too, um, but it's the right thing to do. Let me give you a sense. I have a 36 foot boat rented today in Key Largo. Yeah, and our good True. friend is sending us pictures of his uh, blue marlin. That's just unbelievable that he's catching. We're very jealous not to be there. But to, to look at the Italian experience explicitly, they, in Lombardy, which is the region around and containing Milan, they had their first sick patient diagnosed on February 20th. Um, less than four weeks later, they in that same region, those hospitals in that area had almost 800 patients on ventilators four weeks later, actively, not total, I mean actively that day. So that is an explosion of critically ill and dying patients. So I have two quick, uh, cute uh, things that came through, one from a nice colleague that said there's no data to support any over-the-counter supplements to help treat or prevent COVID. Um, I also had a very cute uh, email that says, uh, uh, one of the people participating, uh, that his cleaner said she's staying home, but she's sending instructions. So I think that's very cute. And I think I'm gonna give those instructions to our children as well, who Perfect. maybe right now are gonna learn how to clean. Perfect. Maybe, but I'm not sure. Um, I heard the virus adheres to cardboard. So be careful with Amazon packages, uh, gloves, question mark. No, yeah. there's, there's data. There's data on that. Stainless steel surfaces, hard plastic surfaces that can survive for probably three days. Cardboard has been studied at maybe up to 24 hours. So I guess, yeah. Hand washing. Yeah, right. Hand washing. That makes it easy. If we are in a high risk group, will wearing an N95 mask when going to the grocery store help? So first of all, um, they're really unavailable. Um, we can't get them. You can't get any more of them. We are really limited. Um, and the guidelines really are not for uh, people to wear N95s unless they are in contact with patients who um, and have a very high exposure. I understand um, the concern. I think if you're in a high risk group and you had a regular surgical mask, I wouldn't fault you for wearing that, but it's really much more about hand washing. And they're even with just wearing a regular surgical mask, there's no specific guidelines on that. Well, and let me just make a couple quick comments on that if you don't mind. First of all, I don't even wear an N95 when I'm encountering patients unless I'm gonna do something like an intubation or um, some other airway procedure. So regular surgical mask is all I'm gonna wear. And I'm in a higher risk environment, although not a higher risk demographic, not yet. But I'm gonna ask oh, you a get, question. Getting there. Okay. Um, the other thing is, we've had some amazing opportunities come forward. A large construction firm had a few hundred N95 masks that apparently these are used for drywalling, grinding, and other types of work. And they, they provide them to our health system. Thank you so much. The Indian Hill Health, uh, Indian Hill School District yesterday found a storage of 3,600 surgical masks and brought them to us. That's fantastic because we're truly low and there's probably some out there, you know, um, if you do drywalling and have a stack of them, well, think about sharing them with a friend. 
So I have a question. So uh -oh. there's been stuff on social media just about the fact that our guidelines for not using the N95 masks um, is really because our supply is low. Yeah. And that the messaging from China and South Korea yeah. is that they've been much more uh, protected. And you think that's not the case. You I think don't. that's not, not in, and again, not for random people, but in the healthcare situation. Yeah, no, I don't. Uh, just based on the droplet size and the method of spread. When you're doing your drive through testing, are your um, staff that are doing the swabbing wearing N95s? Yes. And so when I was doing that, when I was working with that crew the other day, um, we did create, and um, I was very pleased we were, we were able to go from concept at the end of last week to fruition, having a testing center up and running on Tuesday and tested 197 people. Unfortunately, the supplier was unable to continue to provide the testing vials, but um, we built that quickly. And when we did it, um, the people checking the patients in, uh, myself when I was interviewing them, for example, I only wore a regular surgical mask. The person actually doing the swab necessarily wore the N95 and had to change gown and gloves between every patient. So you don't think about it. If you're worried and well, um, you're not just taking up a test kit if you get tested. I have to use an entire set of personal protective gear that I could use for a critically ill patient to acquire your one test. Okay, a couple more. Should we completely avoid the grocery and only do delivery? So that's an interesting question. Um, I will tell you that we are still going to the grocery store infrequently. We are really, we are really doing um, nothing else, just so you know, and our children are really frustrated with us. Really, we are really staying uh, close to home um, and it's hard um, going to work and coming home. Um, but we are going to the grocery store just because again, um, that's the one place we're running in, running out. I think we are you know, trying to do the six foot distance. It's not perfect. You wash your hands before you go, you wash your hands as soon as you get home um, and you're careful. I think if you can do and you like to do um, delivery, that that's great. Again, the less people we all come in contact with, the better. Aren't we already too late, especially in places like New York? I think that means in terms of the social distancing and the, you know, the self-quarantining. Um, I think we're late in some places. Yes, actually, I do. And, you know, I, I, I think none of us really know what the trajectory is going to be. And I think we all hope, really, I think we can all sit here and say we all hope that we've really overreacted and that this is going to be better than we think it's gonna be. I think, I honestly still think it could really be much worse than we even anticipate yet, and it's just too early to tell. And so this is why right now, not two weeks from now, it's ever so important to do the social distancing and really, again, minimize contact and make your kids minimize contact. Um, I look at, you know, 475 people died in Italy alone yesterday. Italy's not a big country. All right. Any data on Max side or Procardia? I heard you mention hypertension in yesterday's live, right? Yesterday, what I was talking about was um, ACE inhibitors, um, and medications like lisinopril for treating hypertension. So the small data has come out that hypertension appears to be a risk factor for more serious um, infections and more serious complications and death. When they've started to roll back and actually look at it, why would hypertension be the cause? It may be, in fact, that it's the type of the most commonly used medication to treat hypertension, which is lisinopril, and that because of the way that the lisinopril works, it actually allows the virus to attach more and have a more robust infectious response. Now, again, it's limited um, data. As I said yesterday in my office, and my husband will kill me for saying this, he stopped his lisinopril. I'm still taking mine. Um, We're a so, randomized controlled trial. <laughs> so I don't think the data is strong enough. Um, but um, it, it's limited. Um, and again, I had several questions from patients yesterday just saying, you know, should they switch? And in this circumstance, I'm actually fine to switch if patients would like to switch. Um, but I don't think there's enough data to mandate doing it. And I don't think, um, like, I'm not going to send out a big email, email news blast to all of my patients saying, please call me. I want to take you off your lisinopril yet. But again, he stopped his. Um, and in terms of Maxide or Procardia, uh, no data about that at all. They work completely differently than the ACE inhibitors. And so I don't think that they should be a problem in terms of the infection. Oh, it's very specific to ACE inhibitor related medications, if it's a factor at all. 
Would you travel by automobile to visit family out of town if both families have been self self isolating? So we had a conversation with our children about this last night, actually, which is, um, you know, it's hard. So should family, right? We talked about this a little yesterday. You know, you have an adult child who's living in another city who gets laid off from work, who's now going to be home working in an apartment all by themselves. Should they come back to Cincinnati to be with family? Is that an okay thing? Should families who are separated or siblings separated, you know, come together and mix, you know, less is more, less contact is better. But in my opinion, if everybody's been trying to self isolate, that that is, I mean, I'm going to let my son come home. We were talking about siblings seeing each other. Um, I, I think it's okay. I mean, there's just, we're all at risk. It's not perfect. Um, it's trying to minimize risk. I bought Kinsa digital Bluetooth thermometer. It tracks all users and gives local and national data on people with fevers. Company has millions, so database larger than CDC, according to Rachel Maddow Show. Works with app and shows you people in your area and school for fevers. Okay, I know nothing about that, do you? Okay, no. and I didn't hear it on Rachel Maddow, but uh, thank you for that information. It's called Kinsa digital Bluetooth thermometer. All right, very interesting. Um, I had a doctor appointment this morning and he had a mask on and stood in the hall for my appointment. At what point do you think home health aides will be asked to stay home? Um, so I'm not sure what type of doctor appointment you had this morning. I understand what your physician was doing, right? So trying to, um, kind of still do social isol isolation and he's trying to protect he or she trying to protect you from being exposed to anything he has and vice versa. Um, it's the reason that for elective visits, I'm doing telehealth visits because, um, again, I just think, you know, if you don't need to come in because you don't need a physical exam and because you're not acutely ill, that it's better to do it via telehealth. So I'm not sure exactly that situation. Um, but, you know, again, that's the rationale. So home health aides, the same thing, which is, again, I think if um, people don't need the home health aides, then they should stay home. But clearly there's people we have to have home care still. There are people that still depend on it. And as healthcare workers, um, we're really gonna have to do it, but people will be wearing masks and washing hands. So in our, in our system, basically, uh, in my situation, if I am exposed to someone and I don't have the appropriate gear on at that time, I'm then going to begin wearing a mask or if, you know, I have any risk based on some exposure that I've got, I'm going to wear a mask, even if I'm asymptomatic for probably the next two weeks uh, in our clinical arena. And we're asking our associates to do that. So when you see a nurse or a physician and they have a mask on, he or she uh, may have just simply had an exposure uh, and they're trying to protect you. Is metoprolol also a possible issue? Uh, no. Um, should we stay away from people who have been in airports or on airplanes? If so, for how long? Um, so social distancing from everybody, but yes, I would tell you it's those people who have been on airplanes and in airports, particularly if they've come from other countries, they're the ones that should be kind of isolating themselves. Um, the, the, you know, incubation period is 14 days. So for example, when someone's coming home from Europe, they start the 14 days from when they left Europe and when they got off that plane. Um, and again, yes, uh, you know, try to distance yourself from people that have been exposed to large quantities of people. That's, that's the deal. Uh, and I think, let's see. Oh, one more. The company I work for is not providing masks for us as a home health aides and still asking us to see clients. Well, so again, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to see patients in the emergency department. I'm not going to wear a mask unless they're on our respiratory side. Uh, and we've literally divided into two entirely separate areas based on complaint. A patient, you know, if you're doing home health care for a patient who is isolated at home, doesn't have any contacts to worry about and doesn't have a respiratory complaint, that's fine. Um, you, you going out into the community may actually be a more uh, worrisome vector for them 
um, over time. So that, that well, that's actually, actually, what, greater, I, that's actually what I mean. Isn't the reason yeah. the same thing you talked about the healthcare worker right, that exactly. someone who's seeing a bunch of patients <clears throat> ought to be wearing it to protect the other patients? Yes, that would be I, that would be my considerations if you've had any exposure. Um, have you? I, I I don't know. I don't know which company you're working for, and I don't know if you've asked. But again, I, when we've started in the office, all of my staff and I are wearing masks again because. You know, we've been swabbing people and we've had a lot of people in the office um, and certainly even before the numbers went up. So we are worried that we are a vector. So we don't want to expose anyone else. And so that's really the reason. And it doesn't. Um, and, I, and I don't and I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. And there's never a time the provider needs to wear an N95 mask to protect right. the patient. Uh, that's not the issue. Right. Um, it's aerosolized from the patient. Okay. I'm probably just hoping to hear something different, but if elective knee replacement was postponed for 30 days from April 7th, is it likely it will be delayed even? Yes. 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 Sorry. I know. Um, and, and, and you, you know, I know, I know, I know you, and I know you really need this knee replacement and you're really anxious to get it done. And I feel your pain for you, but um, I don't know. It may be, maybe June. And there's so many reasons. When we do elective surgery, we're using up again more of our protective equipment, all of which we need for our ICU patients, et cetera. When you stay in the hospital for a couple of days, right now our hospital has beds. We've, we've, out of all of our hospitals, we've stopped elect, elective procedures. We're having them empty out, um, but that's because we really think this is coming. All right, I think we're, Done. Thank you for all the great questions and for all the attention. And uh, one of us will be back tomorrow. Um, maybe we'll get him back again tomorrow. Um, and I'm hoping to have Dr. Cheryl Kingsburg, who's a behavioral health um, psychologist from uh, University Hospitals Cleveland, uh, participate as well, just to talk about stress management in this time. Not sure if she's going to get on with us tomorrow or early next week, but we'll keep you posted. Um, thank you. Have a great day. Uh, stay home, stay safe, stay, stay healthy.